welcome to the first lecture of the Center for Leadership 2015-2016 Leadership Lecture Series. My name is Liliana Rojas. I am the Coral Wave Branch Manager from Mercantile Commerce Bank and proud sponsors of today's event. The leadership lectures were established in 2011 and to today have brought more than 23 distinguished and world-renowned speakers to FIU and our community. Today is not exception. I would like to take a minute and recognize several distinguished members of our community that are with us this morning. College of Business Dean Jose Aldrich. <laughs> Board of Advisors Roberto Munoz, President from South Florida Market BBBA Compass Bank. And to our students from the Greater Miami Adventist Academy who took the time today. It's now my distinct privilege to introduce you to Myra Beers, Director of Strategy and Implementation for the Centers for Leadership at FIU. As a founding member of the Center for Leadership, Myra was instrumental in the development and implementation of the Center's Executive Development Program, which were ranked number one in the country in 2014 by HR.com. Myra holds a PhD in history from FIU and graduate certificates in Latin America and Caribbean studies and African New World studies. Ladies and gentlemen, Myra Beers. Good morning. Please join me this morning in thanking Mercantile Commerce Bank for the fourth year to be our sponsor. As Liliana mentioned, this is our fifth year of the lectures. Time really goes very fast uh, when you're having fun. And we do have fun because it brings to us and to our campus some of the world's most distinguished leaders in both academics and in business and uh, provides our students an opportunity to interact with the world's best. This morning is no exception. Mr. George Feldenkrais is with us today, the chairman and CEO of Perry Ellis International. Mr. Feldenkrais is the founder of Perry Ellis International, a Doral-based apparel company that he began in the 1960s uh, from a very small beginning. Uh, in 1961, uh, Mr. Feldenkrais, who was born in Cuba and attended the University of Havana, where he studied law, uh, left Cuba in 1961 in February, actually very close to the time when I left Cuba. So uh, I remember those days very well. Uh, in 1961, he came to Miami with knowing a little bit of English and about $700 in his pocket. And within a very short period of time, he founded a company called Supreme International, which imported apparel from Japan. In the 1990s, that company went public, and within a very short period of time, uh, the company also purchased Perry Ellis International brand. And um, just really an amazing story. Within a very short period of time, this company has become a multinational corporation that now employs over 2,600 people and has sales worldwide of more than $2 billion. That's billion. Uh, Mr. Feldenkrais is also not only an accomplished businessman, but he is a very generous philanthropist. Among his many um, activities in our community, he and his wife Maria are members of the United Way Million Dollar Roundtable. We are so honored to have him here with us, and we ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. George Feldenkrais. Thank you, Maria. Uh, just for the record, the sales are one billion, 
<laughs> but when you go to retail, it's two billion. So you were okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope it's a great day for you, as it is for me. I like to thank. Uh, I like to thank first of all FIU for inviting me to the leadership uh, lecture series. And for giving me the, today the opportunity to address such a distinguished group of faculty, alumni, and students, I am honored and humbled by your decision. For those of you who are surprised to hear uh, Felix Christ's name with a Spanish accent, I was born in Cuba to Russian immigrants in 1923. I started to work when I was 15 years old. I was a poor kid, and after I finished a summer working, uh, my father, I told in September, my father, I'm going back to school. And he said, you can go back to school, but you can work at night. You can work during the day and go at night, so we don't have to lose your income. So I completed high school at night classes and then continued to work while pursuing a law degree at Havana University. So let me tell you a little bit about myself other than that. After I became a lawyer, I thought uh, I have a great future ahead of me. I'm 22 years old, I'm a lawyer, it's important. Uh, there was, uh, unfortunately, very soon we had the advent of the revolution. In Cuba, we had great expectation for new freedoms, and we all, uh, really 90% of people, were happy and uh, glad that we had a revolution because we are going to be free of oppressing dictatorship, free of injustices, free of corruption. We're going to build a new country. We were going to have change. Unfortunately, change turned out to be lies, and I was confronted like my father with the choice of staying in the land where I was born or facing an uncertain future in a new country, like some of you are facing now that you have to live. I just met some kids from Venezuela that have the same situation as I had at that time. I chose freedom. Two years later, in 61, I arrived in Miami with a pregnant wife who had a little girl like that one sitting there, a one-year-old son, and shattered dreams of becoming a successful lawyer and businessman. I found a country where my law degree had very little value, where I have no friends or any close relative. It was a very dark hour for me, brought about by my desire to live in a country where I could have freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of religion, and where I wouldn't have to conform to the tyrannical oppressor's vision of how I should live my life. Soon after, I started a company that imported motorcycle parts from Japan. There was a new motorcycle coming to the United States, and I was asked to get parts for something new called Honda, which today you know what Honda means. At that time, it was the most have new toy for consumers. And the factory was shipping as many bikes as they could put together. But they forgot to send spare parts to repair the bikes when they were, they went bad. So there was a, I took advantage of a window of opportunity and began to supply Japanese motorcycle parts to the largest distributor in the United States. I started going to Japan in 1963. Because I, I asked my father if I could take $2,000 of the 4000 that he had saved all his life and had in Miami. And uh, I took that money and went for one month to Japan. In those days, you pay $10 a, a day for a hotel in Japan. Today, you pay about $300 for this or 400 for the same room. A few years later, in 1966, I went to visit my brother who had emigrated to Puerto Rico. He went to Puerto Rico because uh, he asked me, uh, George, come with me. And I told him, no, that, no, uh, Isaac, I'm staying here under the American flag because when the communists win, I want to be the first commissar of Florida. 
but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go again out of my home to emigrate to a new country if I'm in Puerto Rico. I don't know what's gonna happen in Puerto Rico. Anyway, he went there. I stay here, and he got involved in representing uh, importers of apparel. Then he asked me, why don't you go into Japan anyway? Why don't you find a factory that can make for us uh, boy, uh, back to school shirts and pants for boys and girls and uh, guayaberas? So I did. I, I went to Japan. I found a, a guy who could make guayaberas and I make shirts and pants. And we started Supreme International in Puerto Rico. We couldn't do it. We couldn't go any higher. It's supreme and international, so we were covered. <laughs> Thirty years later, in 2001, we renamed Supreme International Perrielis International. The automotive in the automotive business, I did well because it specifically targeted niche market, which others didn't see. First, it provided Japanese motorcycle parts, and later we expanded into automotive transmission parts for repairing Japanese cars. We were, the, we were at that point, 1973, the United States started to import Toyotas, uh, Nissan, Honda, but again, cars were coming in, and there were no parts to repair the new automotive transmission. So. We were all able to build a healthy business, which I sold in 2001 in order to allow more time to run Perrielis. By 93, Supreme International was growing so fast that I had run out of collateral to pledge to the bank's financing us. I offered my wife or whatever else they wanted, but uh, they didn't want to take that. It was then that we had an opportunity to sell one third of the company through a public offering. And from that point, we grew from 33 million in sales to about a billion today. Today we own 27 brands, including Perrielis, Original Penguin, Laundry by Shelley Siegel, nice dresses. Guavera, Gacha, Savan, and others. We also make all Nike swimwear in the United States as a licensee, and we are finding great success in golf apparel with Callaway, Ben Hogan, Grand Slam, PGA, and other sports brands. This year, Perry Ellis will finish with revenues close to 1 billion. We employ about 2,600 people, of which 300 are in Asia. We have offices in 10 locations overseas. Uh, six of them are in the, in the China area, four in mainland China, one in Taipei and one in Hong Kong. We operate out of eight offices and warehouses in the United States, and we have a major operation in London. We are probably one of the largest men's sportswear apparel companies in the United States. In the last 40 years, the manner in which we shop has changed in many ways that could not have been foreseen before. After the end of World War II in 1945, the demographics explosion created the suburbs and the big shopping centers. Soon these mega malls spread to urban areas as well. Americans had a plethora of different retail stores in a vast variety of cities and regions. But now we have gone from these small storekeepers all over the nation to a conglomeration of mega stores which have become mega brands by themselves. Strange as it might seem 40 years ago, Sam Walton had six stores called Walmart are like 5,000 today. The largest retailer and maybe largest company in the world today has one and a half million employees. Just 25 years ago, a company called Kohl's started business and now they have over a thousand stores and do $20 billion business. However, that might be past part of the past. 
The consolidation of retailers into a few mega companies has by its very nature reduced the availability of fashion brand diversity when you walk into a store. Meaning the opportunities for consumers to buy more brand within a certain space has been more difficult. But what seems like a negative can also lead to positive results. This new environment has given rise to uh, existence of totally new concepts. Vertical retailers like Zara, H&M, Forever 21, Mango, etc. are finding great success, especially with millennials or the younger crowd, which is you. So the question is, will there be one format that will conquer all others? Or will human creativity continue to devise innovation in new ways to shop and new brands to buy? <clears throat> Today, 15% of apparel sales flow through the internet. And same-day delivery is changing dramatically and with unforeseen consequences for many businesses in the future. Will drones delivering product be more popular than FedEx? Will people buying groceries at Publix go there or will they buy through the internet and women don't have to waste time going to the grocery because they get it at home for the same price and the same day? What are the consequences of those things really happening? And in what measure? The Chinese say that may you live in interesting times. And I believe in very interesting times. So congratulations. You are living in very interesting times. I don't think we could have chosen a better era to be part of. Challenging? Yes. Inspirational? Yes. We are living in the era of uncertainty. It used to be that the only thing we knew for sure were death and taxes. Now we don't even know how much taxes we're going to pay next year. However, we can be certain about change, which will continue to occur in the next few years. And your goal as Boring entrepreneurs is to recognize patterns, niches, and needs and be the first to fulfill them. Today, more consumers connect to the internet by phone than by PCs. Who would have thought about it five years ago? So what can we learn from all of this? The key to survival is flexibility. Keep your mind open. Adaptability to change and willingness to transform yourself into something different. Business success is the ability to evolve as soon as there is best visibility to what's new in the horizon. It was the same when I first started out and it's even more so today. The evolution now is quicker, so there is no time to lose or contemplate. You have to be able to jump ahead of the competition because for every great idea out there, from the same place, there are more coming. If the follow through is the implementation that determines your success. And some words of advice for the young entrepreneurs here. Today, it's about discipline. Teamwork is crucial. Don't think that you're working in silos. The guy next to you is very helpful to you, regardless what you think about him. And focus on what you're doing. Today, consumers are controlling the conversation. About anything else, you have to cater to the consumer. 
you have to make the consumer the essential part of your business. Brand integrity and reputation must be maintained if you want to stay in business. Today, the old phrase of the customer is always right is more true than it has ever been. As business people, we have to remember that excellence, excellence is always the baseline, nothing else. You need to believe that you're the best in what you're doing. And you're not, you are not doing it to the best of your ability. That's not enough. You're doing it better than anybody else can do it. That's very important that you have that confidence in yourself. Passion. Without it, you're a lame duck. Believe that whatever you're making or selling is the best product or service available. By the way, there is no substitute for hard work. You have to be ready to make whatever sacrifices are necessary in order to be successful. I don't know of any successful entrepreneur who doesn't work far more hours than the average guy in the street. And you have to sacrifice. If you have an exam tomorrow, tell the girl or the boy that you cannot go out with them tonight. You'll go tomorrow. Be honest. Be honest with your friends. Be honest with your bosses. Be honest with your vendor. Be honest with your people. In the long run, honesty is the easiest and cheapest way to success. Honesty and ethical behavior must always govern your thoughts and action. It is not true by shortcutting ethics you get there faster. Not true. Learn. I still learn something new every single day. Life is a wonderful, never-ending learning experience. Intellectual curiosity is the key to success. You always have to wonder. You always have to be curious about what's happening. And you have to read. Maybe spend less time on social network and more reading what's happening around you. It's critical. Listen to your friends and even children, new ideas. Many of them are fabulous. I've learned a lot of things from my grandchildren. As the world changes and you consider your many options in life, try to choose the right ones. Because the success in life is having choose, chosen a succession of good options. A succession of choosing a bad option is a bad thing in life. And always remain optimistic. As a teenager, I always dreamed that maybe someday I'll be able to talk to people like you. And I would be able to build a company the size of Perrielis. And help others. Philanthropy is happiness. Whatever we accomplish is always accompanied by the work of many other people that preceded you and many others that work with you. Help your alma mater. Help those in need. When historians study our time, they will probably see that in the last 50 years, the transformation of business, our society, and our way of life has been the fastest changing period in the history of humanity. Tremendous technological achievement we have experienced that have changed our lives in many different ways. Facebook did not exist 12 years ago. Just 12 years ago. When you entered into high school, there was no Facebook. Twitter is about six years old. The word Google didn't exist 20 years ago. And of course, never none of the eyes, like the iPhone and the iPad and the iPod. And you couldn't read a book on a computer or on a pad and buy groceries on your computer or your telephone and have it delivered to your home in a few hours. Think about all those little things that have happened in just a few years. The advances of medicine have been outstanding. 
from a pill that you swallow and it takes uh, an x-ray of all your body. Genetic therapy, non-intrusive surgeries, and constantly developing new cures for cancer, hepatitis C, cardiac, and other sicknesses. There is no question that as you look into the future, thinking about what some of us have seen in the last 20 years, we cannot imagine what amazing life we have in front of us, especially in front of you. While it becomes fashionable to talk about the decline of the United States and the West, I am an optimist, and I have a profound confidence in the American people's character and its ability to create new ideas, our entrepreneurship, and above all, the free enterprise system. When I arrived in this country, the United States had just selected its first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy. Black people in the South were asked to sit in the back of the bus, and their children could only go to segregated school. And a few years after the Holocaust, Jews were not accepted at many universities, hotels, clubs, and even in some neighborhoods in Miami Beach. With China and Russia together, it seemed that communism, intolerance, and injustice were the wave of the future. Russia had just beaten the United States with the Sputnik. Khrushchev and Fidel Castro were threatened in the whole world. But eventually the Berlin Wall fell and communism is a distant nightmare. We won. Unfortunately, we now have different nightmares while some of our old enemies are trying to build back. During all these traumatic years, I lived through Vietnam with the divisiveness, divisiveness it created and its worldwide social and economic consequence. I lived through Desert Storm, 9-11, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the 2008 financial meltdown. But through all those years, I saw the American spirit soar. I have seen an African-American become president of this great country, and I have seen a Jew as a candidate for vice president of the United States, and today Bernie Sanders is a candidate for president. More Hispanics have come to the United States in the last 30 years than the total population of Central America. Think about it. More Hispanics have come in the last 30 years into the United States than the total population of Central America. I have seen discrimination of black, Jews, Catholic, Native American, gay, and lesbian fade away in the most tolerant and accepting society the world has ever known. While we still have a long journey to travel together to build a better society, we must congratulate ourselves on what this great country achieved in the last 50 years. I've traveled the whole world, or most of it. And I can tell you that there has never been a country in the world where minorities and ethnic groups are as welcome, accepted, and finally integrated into society as the United States of America. I think that is due to the great qualities of the American people and our belief in freedom and fairness in all being, men being created equal, in the sense of community, involvement, ethic, charity, love of God, and the love of your neighbor. As we face together an uncertain future in this epoch of uncertainty, we will continue to learn and to overcome our difficulties and strengthen our principles to remain a beacon of hope for all oppressed people in the world and in the United States. Let's all be proud about our heritage. This is the greatest country the world has ever known. This is the best group of people that God ever put together. We don't impose our lifestyle on anybody. And 
its others, whether fascist, communist, or radical religious leaders, its others who want to impose their views on our way of life. I want to thank uh, my, my wife, my children, Oscar and Fanny, and grandchildren and who make my life more enjoyable, and to all my associates, without their hard work, I would have achieved nothing. And today, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to talk to you. It's a real honor. I find privilege to be recognized by this great institution that you're members of. And I wish all the very best that I have to offer for each one of you. Work hard and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Uh, Mr. Feldenkrais has agreed to take some of your questions. So I think they're going to queue up some microphones right now. We need you to come up to the microphone if you would. One microphone. Considering your worst times since you founded Supreme International in 61, how did you manage to push through? What was your mindset? Well, I tried to give you a short explanation. I just, uh, it was very hard. I, I met some partners who, have, who left a couple of years ago for Spain and uh, I was getting $300 a month salary, a month. I cleared up. Of course, those days $300 bought more than today. But that's really how I started and I was able to, to go out. We wished to go out every day through Hialeah looking for customers. I had some contacts in Belgium for steel and nails. I tried to sell steel and nails. Nobody wanted to buy from me because now they're being imported from Japan in those days. And eventually I was able to visit a guy who told me, I don't use nails, but if you can get glass from me, I'll, I'll buy glass from you. And uh, I went out to the Department of Commerce office. I got a list of every factory of glass in the world. There aren't too many. And I sent a letter. I sat down on an underwood. I don't know whether you know what an underwood is. It used to be a typewriter where you write. <laughs> and uh, I sent letters all over the world. And I got a company in Portugal that uh, answered me and gave me prizes. And this guy in Hialeah bought from me <laughs> window glass. I made a commission, then I started to sell screws, bolts, and nuts from Japan. Eventually sold some auto parts, and auto parts put me to motorcycle parts. Uh, and then uh, the motorcycle parts grew, and I was able to go to Japan in 63. And, and uh, I was a... Uh, I get to Japan the first time, I'm... Uh, I'm, I think, a little bit older than you. I'm about 25 years old. No, I'm 28 years old. And uh, I started the Japanese in those days, took you to all kinds of factories. I'm a Cuban refugee that knows a little bit about law and a little bit about this and that, but I have never been at a factory, much less the factories that make automobile parts and motorcycle parts and all. So I learned a lot. When I came back in 1963, I was an authority on motor how you make motorcycle parts. So I was able to grow that business. And by 66, when I went to see my brother in Puerto Rico, to, he asked me about uh, bringing in Guayaveras and all that. I was already making a nice living and uh, making a little bit of money. And that, that continued to compound itself. Do you have any daily rituals today? Daily rituals. Daily rituals. <laughs> you have to be organized. 
After I get up, I do some exercises. I, I try to stay in good shape. It's, uh, I have seen that that's, it's very important to exercise and watch your diet. And, uh, and then I have breakfast and I go to work. Whether I go or now, I have an office in my home. Sometimes I stay in the office at home working. But today it's different. Today you have a, you have a computer scanner, you have a computer, you have telephone, you have everything. So you, in reality, if you are disciplined, you can work from anywhere. Other than that, I go to the office, which is a few blocks away from here. And uh, I do whatever you have to do at that point. You interview people, you meet with people, you meet with, uh, with the, I meet with my son, my daughter, who are both working in the company. And that's my daily routine. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, George. Uh, my name is Reginald Richardson. Richardson? Good morning. And here's my question. Uh, you mentioned change. Uh, going back all the way to that day that you fled Cuba back in 1961 to where you are now, what are some of the steps that you took to become recognized as a leader in the industry that you recognize as today? Absolutely. Yeah, what happened? Well, you become a leader in, in anything just by working very hard at what you do. And uh, as our business in uh, in apparel kept growing, people start to respect you, both the vendors, because you buy you buy bigger quantities. Your uh, your employees get more motivated because as you grow, you have to employ more people. Pay you can pay higher salaries. You make more money. And uh, the customers, uh, for example, today, when we go to Macy's, it's not only Perriel, but we have Penguin there, we have maybe Laundry, we have Savan, we have Nike Swim. So you are more respected by your customers. So it's a conglomeration of uh, good things that happen when you grow, and you're good with your customer and with your people. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Javon Howe. I'm actually a senior, and I actually wanted to ask you, through your backstory, you alluded strongly to risk, sacrifices, and flexibility being paramount for today and future entrepreneurs. For someone like myself, who hopes to one day walk your path, what would you like to impart on me and also anyone else in this room who also wants to have, you know, those dreams of being an entrepreneur come true? What can you basically tell us that can help us make that first step, especially when it comes down to the fear of uncertainty when starting a business? Um, how, what advice you would, would you give him as a budding entrepreneur? Gotcha. I did. I gave you advice I could now. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, I'll, I'll make a synopsis for you and I give me your address. I send it to you. <laughs> That's fine. Trust me. I wouldn't mind. I'd be happy to give you more of the advice, but basically it's hard work. And persevere if you find something that you believe in, keep going on it. Don't be disappointed. I used to go out and uh, the first day after I came to the United States, I came, I, I tried to sell Japanese made parts for American cars. And we're talking now about 1961, 1962. Uh, Pearl Harbor was 45. We're only talking 17 years after Pearl Harbor. So Americans still had a very, very bad feeling to Japan in those days. And uh, I used to go to a place and they used to tell me, get the hell out of here. We don't want to see anything made in Japan. And especially with my accent, I took it twice at discrimination. So I got the hell out of there and I went to see somebody else. <laughs> you keep on going, no matter what, you keep on going. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi. My name's Allison Langer. I'm going to take my gum out so I don't choke. Um, I am wearing laundry. Thank you very much for buying that brand. I love it. Um, I have a very simple question. I wanted to know how you came up with the name Perry Ellis. No, I didn't come up with that name. I, don't, I never claimed that. Perry Ellis was an American designer born in 1940, went to the College of Mary and what, in Virginia. William and Mary, and uh, he became a designer, 
he had a grand design talent um, for a company called Vera uh, Scarves. Vera still makes scarves for women. And Vera was bought by a company called Manhattan Industries. It was a big men's uh, shirt company those days. He went to work in Manhattan in about 1980. Uh, no, but in the late mid 70s, he was uh, he was about 35, 36 years old. At that time, he was very successful with his cars, and he had the president of the company that he wanted to design a line under his name, which uh, the guy let him do for women's actually, and then uh, he launched a line for men's. Perry Ellis was a pioneer in bringing American fashion to the United States. In those days, the big designers were uh, European designers that women used to use, Pierre Cardin, this and this and that. And the American designer, the, the old group that was like uh, Oscar de la Renta, Jeffrey Bean, uh, and there was a new group that was coming up, and it was Perry Ellis and Calvin Klein. At that point, uh, Ralph uh, Lauren was only making ties and later went into t uh, shirts and other items, but that, that is the story. The problem is that unfortunately, uh, Perry got uh, AIDS. He was the first American big designer that uh, died from AIDS, and he died from AIDS in 1986. Uh, he had the best design studio in the United States in those days. You know today Mark Jacobs, uh, Tom Ford, Isaac Mizrahi, all those guys worked for Perry Ellis in the Perry Ellis Design Group uh, in the 80s. And uh, this is the greater, gen greater generation of American fashion designer ever. And they, when Perry dies, each one of them took their own, except for Mark Jacobs. Mark Jacob, kept on working for Manhattan Industries on the Perry Ellis side. But in 1992, he had a very bad collection on the... Perry Ellis left the trust to benefit his daughter. He had a daughter, and uh, he left a, a trust that was the J.P. Morgan a law firm where his partners came from. And... Uh, well, Somebody else. Oh my God. And, uh, oh yeah, the lady that was the mother of the daughter. Those were the three uh, owners of the trust. So we negotiated with the, they, they were, uh, they were receiving income from licensing, but the way they were managing, they were spending more than half of it. So they figured that if they sell the brand, they will get more money in interest than what they were making, having the risk of the brand going bad. So that's an opportunity that I had about the, the brand. But the company was Supreme International. Couldn't go any bigger or wider. Hi, my name is Betty. Um, in your opinion, how can a leader fail? How can a what? Oh, a leader fail, I would say, that's an interesting question I would have to think about, but there is no question in my mind that a leader s fails for arrogance, and arrogance is a big thing. Don't think too high about yourself, because you're not that high. And uh, another issue is if you slow, if you slow enough, if you take it easy, don't take it easy because there is a guy behind you that wants to work and take your position up. There is always somebody looking to take your business away or to take your position. So you cannot, you cannot go to sleep. You have to keep on working and you have to keep an open mind. The open mind to me, an open, a guy who is arrogant and doesn't want to hear and he thinks he's always right is the worst thing that can happen to a human being. That's, that's a sure formula for very few people have been successful with those qualities of arrogance, but never of slowing up. The only example that I know for sure is Steve Jobs, who personally was a very 
a non grata person, was a very difficult guy to deal with. But look at what he built, the biggest, uh, the most valuable company that ever existed. And also, um, can you tell me a time as you fell as a, as a leader? Um, a, tell, a, tell, a time, a time as you fell as you failed as a leader. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> a lot of times. <laughs> Hard to remember how many. <laughs> but a few years ago, we... We were doing very well in 11, and then we had, uh, we bought more brand that we could handle maybe. And some of the brands, we didn't have enough time to work on them and build them. And uh, we ended up uh, that the brand didn't grow, started to lose money. And the company didn't do well in uh, year 12, 13. And uh, so some activists, which is a new group of people that want to live from what you make uh, came up after our company we defeated them we won uh, we beat them uh, last this last this year in july and but it uh, it was a very hard time it took took time away from us for something more productive so you always have to question yourself what are you doing how can i do it better that's that's one of the things i tell you you can it's very easy to fail in the united states and, and today in the world, the world is flat. So you have to keep always open your mind and keep on and keep on thinking of ways on how to grow. Because if you don't grow, it means that you're going backwards. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Raul Hernandez. I'm an alumni from the Healthcare MBA. You've mentioned a few things about technology. And you mentioned social media. Can you talk about the importance of interpersonal relationships in business. Uh, I myself am an entrepreneur, and I find that that is something that is maybe going by the wayside, and I, I, I see it very valuable. I want to hear your take on it. There is some truth in what you said. There is some truth. The, and uh, your generation is the worst <laughs> on that because you spend too much time with friends on social networking. And let's face it, nothing that you learn from all the Facebooks and all that will help you in life. Maybe it will make you more popular because you have more likes. But, so they like you, so how do you put money in your pocket with all the liking? So, so likes it. <laughs> To be liked, uh, yeah, it's good to be liked. I love it, but <laughs> I have to work. And uh, there is so much time misspent reading what's happening to all your friends and the last party they went and who do they, who do, who the hell do I care that they were with, uh, with J Lo, with Gloria, with this or with that. But what is it important to me? What's important to me is learning about what I have to do and what I'm doing. So, uh, there is a uh, younger people, you, you, I see young people that don't talk to each other. I see that families that sit together and they are, uh, they don't talk to their parents. They keep, the art of conversation, the art of conversation is going to disappear with the way we're going. And there is nothing like a personal relationship because uh, that's why you build friends. And you build businesses that are long run. For example, uh, my son Oscar started to visit customer when he was 20 years old. Today he's a little bit older, but all the guys that he met when he was in his 20s, either they have gone out of business, out of the, they died or they passed away, or he had now among his friends the president of this company and that company, the German, he made, he has a career just because the people he knows. In this world today, it's going to be more difficult because you don't spend that much time with people and you don't interact with people. You interact a lot by computer. You see, a, you go to see a buyer and you're talking about what were your last year's sales and how you're doing and everything is on the computer. So you really don't have much time to, to interact with people and it's a bad thing, but there is nothing we can do about it. You have to do your best to, to have more interaction with people. 
Um, hi, my name is Carla Santana. Um, in, in like, your perspective, what are your greatest strengths and weaknesses as a leader? Oh, I think I have a lot of... I start by the weakness. <laughs> I, I always think that I have many. I, I think sometimes I'm too soft for a businessman. Uh, I tend to procrastinate a little bit. I, I think maybe over too much, too much something. Um, my daughter is looking at me that, no, I'm not that soft that I think. <laughs> she had a face that, what are you saying? What are you talking about? Uh, it, uh, you're always afraid of what the world is going to do, what your competition competition is going to do, so you're always uh, a little bit scared and careful. Strength, I think that uh, life has made me very strong because I had to go to work at 15. I was, uh, at that point, I was making $60 a month, which is more than my father was making. So I had to, I, I know that I had no choice but to make it myself, and uh, I worked very hard to get to be a lawyer, to be respected at least for that, and going to be, I come to the United States, I have to leave my country, come here as a poor guy again, took my many years, then you import, you start to import, in those days you have to pay adv in advance most of your import, you go to talk to bankers, and they look at you like, like you're crazy, how much money you want, what do you want to do? So it has been a constant fight. And last year we had the activists, we had to beat the activists, we have every day something else to beat. So uh, I think I have, I have a lot of inner strength. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Guglielmo. Um, you've mentioned uh, the importance of change for a company to be able to adapt to change and uh, to survive, especially with technology, new advancements. And then you've also mentioned millennials a few times. Um, you know, they're your future employees, they're your customers. And I just wanted to know what uh, your organization is doing specifically to connect with that group, considering that they're the future, they're a huge part of the change that you're talking about. Well, we're trying to hire people. Uh, as a matter of fact, anybody in computer that wants to work, uh, please call us. We're ready to give you a job. Uh, anything else they should ask for? Fanny, some engineering help, Fanny needs. Uh, we do need some engineering help and regarding uh, warehouse organization, etc., etc. Uh, we try to buy Milan to hire young people because that's the future. The young people have a, a couple of things that are different from young people when I was young. Uh, and there is uh, a desire to get to a position too fast. So sometimes applicants just out of school, they don't want a job at whatever we're offering them, but they want to be assistant to the CEO or to COO, and uh, they really don't know anything about the business, but they want to be next to me. And I love to have young people next to me, but I hope that they have the the that they took the right courses and then they work in several positions because uh, when my son came to work for the company, he was in the warehouse. And Fanny also has a good warehouse preparation. So first of all, you have to learn within the company that you're going and you don't have to, you going, going from the bottom is not degrading you on the contrary. You get to know it really from the bottom better than anybody else. So don't rush. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer than what you have in mind today. But you have to pay your dues. You have to pay. Anyway, today young people get to higher position faster than they used to. But uh, don't think that you're going to do it tomorrow because it's not going to happen tomorrow. To very few. Mark, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook is an exception. Don't take that as a rule. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jaslyn. Um, if you would ever mentor a young person, what would be the most important thing that you would tell them? Important thing you could tell a young person. I already told you a lot of good things that you should. <laughs> but uh, you have to be honest, you have to be hardworking, you have to learn every day, you have to keep an open mind. And uh, you have to 
all the things I do. You have to keep on studying, to learning, and keep going. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to FIU and speaking to us. It's been a great honor. And I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to try to stick to them. Pick one. Pick one good one. <laughs> no, I know. Um, so, it was, I, well, yeah, like, her advice, she already gave a lot of advice, so that's fine. But my two questions would be, what, um, how do you deal with uncertainty and when you're scared? And how much influence does God have in your life? Because I, I heard you mentioning God a lot, and I'm curious about that. Scared? Or afraid? Afraid, yeah. afraid of what? Afraid of what? Like, like a time that you've been. Scared. Well, I, I just told you the many things that I'm afraid of. Uh, I'm afraid of failing, so I am. I'm always going to be uh, looking for ways to do better whatever I'm doing because I am afraid of failing. I I come from a very 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 poor background. I don't want to go back there. So fundamentally, that's the motivation in my life. Uh, as far as God, I think God is very important. I believe in God. I think that uh, religion, regardless of what the religion is, uh, usually, except in one religion that's debatable, uh, it, uh, it teaches you to be good to people and to do charity and to help others. So all the religions have a, a great ethical background that it's important in life, uh, to be a better person, a better human being. So to me, I believe in the existence of God, and I believe that uh, in that religions are good for humanity. Thank you. Hey, hi, my name is Anne-Marie, and I only have a very um, short question. I wanted to know if you attributed your success to only your material knowledge or your character, or are they both hand in hand? The material version. But it's always a combination of, of, of the person, of uh, whatever is your DNA, whatever you're born with. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody is born smart. So, uh, but <laughs> and we all have to combat that. We have, all have to become better at what we do. And, and that's how you become better, but by studying, by working hard, and that's a, a, a compound. Uh, and the opportunity of the mega situation, let's say. So, if I would have been, if I would have stayed in Cuba, let's put an example, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I had in the United States. So, sometimes it's the ambient, the, it's not only what you bring to the table where you are. I think that Chinese people in the 60s, 70s, on their communism, couldn't have achieved what they have achieved in the 90s and in the 2000s, because the opportunities that have opened through free enterprise, and that's why I'm a big believer in free enterprise. Thank you. Have just two short questions. Um, first off, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Tyrone Gifford. I'm new to Miami, I'm a software developer, and also I'm a small business owner, so what advice can you give me to start up, grow my business? I'm established in Naples, but I'm not, I'm not established in Miami. And also, you mentioned job opportunities for IT, I'm a software developer, <laughs> so He's a uh, business owner, yeah. who wants your advice on how to grow his business, and he's also looking for a job. Are you a business owner or are you looking for a job? But uh, um, there, there's still more I need to learn, you know. So that's <laughs> well, uh, you have my name in your invitation to this place, so it's George that Feldenkrais at Perry dot com. P E R Y, only one R. Send me an email about your situation. I'll be happy to answer it. Well, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Ashley Martinez. I would like to place you in a hypothetical situation that you've likely been in before. Uh, if you were going to invest your money in a business today, in today's market, what are you looking for? Which factors are you looking for in the business and in the entrepreneur who is taking care of that business? Where would you invest your money? 
you look for in the entrepreneur or in your company? I would look for uh, I always look for well managed companies. I think management is different between success and failure. People are the different between success and failure. So if you're going to invest in a company, look for a company that has good management and good growth potential. It has to do with growth management and the industry in which you are. Evidently, tech, healthcare are. Uh, two favorites of today's world for investing. And uh, the question is, do you buy a, a stock like Apple, who you might or might not think is fully priced, or Facebook? Or uh, should we buy a smaller stock that uh, you think has more growth potential, but doesn't have the strength of a Facebook or an Apple? Those are the decisions. I have a great belief that Apple, Apple is an amazing story, and it's, uh, it's amazing the potential of uh, growth that both of those companies have in Asia and in the rest of the world. Just to close it up, I want to thank Mr. Tony for inviting me to Thank you to all of you and good luck.